thank you for joining us in our first teacher development session with Ms. Denise Williams. As she presents to the staff of the Charles E. Mills Secondary School in the area of teaching strategies. We will now join part one of the session as Ms. Williams introduces the concept of literacy training. Before we have um, the, the information that I have about the Yubra Noids, I will tell them about the Yubra Noids. Sometimes you don't even come in a picture. Okay? Um, unfortunate and often have the unfortunate consequences of dampening students' active involvement in learning. When teachers recognize the importance of content literacy, they teach students to use content literacy strategies. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to charge it to them because after I would have left here today, Ms. Sukhasan, they won't have any excuses to say, well, I don't know what to do. I have no idea of what strategies I can use in the classroom. Okay? Using these strategies, increases students' ability to internalize content knowledge and develop conceptual understanding of subject matter. I'm going to say um, internalize the information. Are they able to use it? I mean, sometimes we have students, we do topics like, and I, for example, in math, I remember, and I always use this example, I remember doing fractions. I think I was in fifth form. And we had to do fractions, and the math lecturer, the math, the math teacher gave us a problem about if you have um, one half of a haystack, and you have another, a third of another haystack, and you put them together, what do you get? Okay. I have two haystacks. I took one half of this haystack, and I took one third of the other haystack, and I put them together. More hair. What, 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 what do we have? More hair. More hair. Right. More hair. 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 Yeah, more here. I take this one, you put that one, you have one big one now. And I take one third of the one. one big hair stack. More hair. More hair. Simple, more hair. That is what I have. Um, and I take this one, you have one big one. And it makes sense. Yeah. Because you know what, you know what is happening in the classroom? We are not developing, um, I want to choose my words. The, the, the students have become so bombarded by what is in the textbook that they're no longer making common sense. Um, they're not reasoning. They're not reasoning. Yeah. The woman often says that man make book and book turn out to fool man. If you, if you understand what it means, right? Because we get too intelligent, we get too smart to think, uh, to reason, so to speak. Okay? So. I want us to think about literacy. And here I have literacy and you. And when we think about when we think about literacy, what are you thinking about? What do you know literacy to be? Reading, comprehension, writing. We often, we often think that read that literacy refers to only reading. And let me tell you, we also need to take writing into consideration. But we even need to take more than that into consideration because there are six language acts. And when we are talking about literacy, we are talking about the ability to communicate in those six ways. We have reading, writing, listening, speaking, and then we have viewing and visually representing. Because we often take the latter two for granted. Watching a movie, if you could watch a movie and understand it, you are literate. If you can draw a picture that conveys a message to your reader or to the viewer, that's an aspect of literacy. So literacy is not just reading and writing. Traditionally, if you could sign your name and um, maybe read your name or read certain things, you will consider literate. So not in today's world. In today's world, you have to be able to do 
much more than just read and write. However, in the schools, the emphasis is placed on the reading and writing. And I'm telling you that because I don't want you to take for granted and ignore the other four language acts. Give students opportunities to listen, give them opportunities to speak. And I want, I want to dwell a little bit on speaking because our classrooms are too quiet. Children don't get to hear, they, they don't have a voice, we don't listen to them, we don't allow them to respond to what we are teaching. Sometimes we are afraid to touch controversial topics, but in the controversial topics are what help the students to become critically literate. And when they talk about critically, liter critically literate, when we look about everybody, everybody we the same thing. Everybody has the same hairstyle. We don't, we don't think for ourselves. We are not able to say, I don't like that. We can say we don't like it, but you can't tell me why you don't like it. You can't make judgments. You can't, we, we are not able to evaluate um, things. And that stems from the classroom. We don't have any practice of it in the classroom. And it spills out into society because we are breeding a society in the classroom. Yes, we are responsible. And I take my share of the blame. That is why I try to do what I can do in order to develop um, critically literate individuals. Right? Um, for the concept of literacy to be meaningful, you must think of it in relation to the unique requirements. And when we talk about the unique requirements, as I said back in the day, reading and writing was sufficient. It was okay. But you need, you need more. Okay, so that's what, that is what it means. You need to think of the context. And it says the context may be as large as a nation or as small as a classroom. Because when we talk about literacy, it could be what they need for that particular classroom, or it can be what they need for the nation, or what they need for the world. One can deduce that being literate is a quality relative to the society in which one lives and to the goals you set for yourselves. I'm just amazed sometimes, even little children, I mean, I have a little girl at home, and she has a tablet. I don't know how to use it. And sometimes she has a problem on it, and she's able to fight. I don't know where she finds these things. Um, I don't know how these young children are able to function, and, and they're so skilled at it, and we are baffling sometimes. And you know, it's just, it's, it's just amazing. And, you know, I hope they learn these things. You know, today I had a discussion with my students and we were talking about, you know, we talk about, we need to understand that the students we, we teach today, they are not us. They are not their grandparents. We have a different breed of digital natives and we have to meet them where they're at. When a baby is born, you know, when a baby was born a couple of years ago, the first thing the child would see is the mother or the father. Nobody said the first thing the child sees is a camera. Because everybody is there with a phone, ready to take a picture. Do you understand the point that I'm trying to make? Because technology has become so, so much a part of their world. And we're shaking our heads and we're saying yes. How many of us use technology in the class? Okay? Um, it is then that we need to bear in mind the goals we have set for our students and the path by which we will get them there. We talk about content literacy strategies. We know where we want our students to be and content literacy strategies will help to get them where we want them to be, so to speak. So let's look at content literacy for a bit because I've, I've, you know, I've been throwing that word around. When we talk about content literacy, we are talking about students being able to use the content that you are introducing them to. We want them to be able to use the information we don't, we don't want them to only be able to remember the information, so to speak. We want them to be able to internalize it. And um, content literacy can be defined as using reading and writing as tools for learning subject matter. So we are using reading and writing to help students learn. There are two phases of reading development. And when I talk about them, one, students first learn to read, and then they read to learn. When they have come to you here at the high school, they're not learning to read. 
they are reading to learn. So how are you going to help them to read information to learn it? One of the things that we don't realize either that when students learn to read, they read a different types of text. They read like those story books. And you wonder, how come they enjoy the stories, but they're not enjoying the text that they get here at high school? How they want to read pictures. They no longer see it attractive. Okay? Um, teachers who make content literacy a priority understand how students learn. So the teacher who is going to take the time to find ways to make learning easier, to make to ensure that the students understand are the ones who, you know, make learning a priority. Their goal is to help students learn content while developing the literacy and thinking skills necessary to become independent lifelong readers. And I'm saying that because the, the content literacy, literacy strategies that they may be taught, that the teacher may use in the math classroom, might be different from the ones that would be appropriate for the science classroom, if you understand what I'm saying. So that is why each person has to step up to the plate and do what you have to do in your content classroom. So the math teacher don't want to think that I'm going to do it in science, so I don't have to be strategic with my instruction. We all have the responsibility. And, and I don't want you to think that the, the English teacher is doing comprehension, so automatically they're supposed to be able to comprehend the science text and the math text, math text and the accounts text. The information, each subject has different demands, has different requirements. So we can't adopt this one-size-fits-all mentality, okay? Providing students with multiple opportunities to construct meaning in subject matter classes enhances their content knowledge. You need to then provide different opportunities for them to use the plethora of strategies that you will become familiar with. Different learning activities. Um, we go to the classroom and, you know, as soon as they get any child, the children, the students' heads are on the desk. And we blame them. And we like, I don't understand, they just have all this negative energy. And every time I come here, they're sleeping. The problem is the students, the problem is you. Because your students feed from your energy. And if they know, oh Lord, we have mats now. And they know that you are going to bring some negative energy, they are going to shut down. If you go being energetic and you go and then, you know, every, well, I don't want to say every day, but you have, you plan activities that you know will excite them and that they'll be actively engaged. You think they're going to be sleeping when you time you get to the classroom? Never. Because I have seen from my experience, different types of math teachers is the same math, is the same content, but it's a different response. And that response is determined by what you, your attitude towards the student, your attitude towards the planning of your work. Am I making sense or am I not making sense? Okay. Yeah, we'll change this subject. But that brings me, French is not a content area. So, let, so maybe I should have done that. When we talk about the content area class, classes, we are talking about math, science, the, the subject areas in which we learn facts. No, that's okay, but I needed to establish that. But when it comes to like Spanish, history, Spanish, French, English, those, those are not content areas. Those are the, the, the subjects in which you learn skills for communication. You understand what I'm saying? So we are, we are talking about the facts where you learn that apple is an apple, and apple has um, some apples, and all apples have a, have a, have a poor. You know, so I stand right. That's 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 the content. Um, but I'll try to use a different content. Um, okay, so let's move let's move a bit to the, the meat 
of why we are here, the substance. So, content literacy strategies. We often like to use the word skills. We want students to develop skills, and we want them to be skilled in this, and we want them to be skilled in that. But how do we develop skills? How do, you, how do you become skilled at something? Practice, demonstrations. Practice. Demonstrations. And therefore, skills before something is developed into a skill, a skill is considered to be automatic. We must first be deliberate in what we do. You just don't jump out your bed at mornings and you're skilled at something. Think about most of when you learn to drive. I remember, I remember one of my first experiences, um, the, the instructor actually had to grab the wheel because I was swerving off the road. No, when I look at them, you know, sometimes I pass learners. And, 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 and I think that I'm very tolerant because I remember when I was there, you know, but it took practice. It took me a couple months before, and I can't even say before I became a skilled driver because it took years for that to happen. But no. I'm able to make certain judgments more quickly than I did back then because I'm a lot more skilled than I was then. Okay? So our students are not automatically going to, be going to develop into skilled readers and writers. We have to take them through the process. They take for granted. We go into the classroom and we don't take into consideration, even though we have previous knowledge, we tend to use that previous knowledge wrong. We use that previous knowledge, sometimes what the student did in the last class. But that's not what the previous knowledge is about. The previous knowledge is what do the students possess in order for them to learn what you are going to be teaching them then. Okay? So, I ask you here, what do you know? Because it forces you to think about what you are going to learn. And then if you know I don't know anything, you're going to be a much more acute listener. Now I'm saying that to say, previous knowledge is very important. And we need to take into consideration students' previous knowledge. And we also want to develop them into students who are going to, the minute they're let up with a piece of reading material, that they think about what they know. They think about what am I bringing to this situation? Okay? So, um, teaching reading and writing explicitly in the content areas builds students' con confidence as text learners as well as their competence in the use of literacy related strategies. So, teaching it in science, teaching it in home economics, teaching it in social studies. Did I miss? I'm not doing that. Teaching it in business management, um, etc., will help the students. All right. And when I talk about the demands for the different content areas for agricultural science or integrated science, students have to write reports. They're not writing any reports for home economics. So, what skills can they take from integrated science to the home economics? If you understand my point. Which means that you now have to teach them what they need to know in order to be successful in your content area. Explicit instruction shows students how to use literacy to think deeply about text. You want them to internalize the information you want when they read. I remember, you could even do simple things like, I remember one year you know, teaching literature here, and the text was. Romeo and Juliet, and it was taught. It was taught to one of the lowest, the lower grades, you know. And in three college, you know what I do? If when you had, if your book was mapped up and you had notes in the margin, I gave you maths. Because you have to encourage students. You have to encourage them to read. Some of them probably just use write nonsense, but nonetheless, I know. Even if they just spend a little time walking the book and take some time to just write in the margin, they got a little. Right? So, uh, we want them to think deeply about the information they are going to be meeting. They have something to do with that, as I say, integrated science, they are planting something. And even though it was not a part of the lesson, a student might say, but Mr. Woodley, this one seemed thing, a little bit rocky. It was not anything that um, would have been a part of the lesson plan. But they are thinking about what they are doing. They are doing some deep thinking. 
They might have to write something in the text and they're going to, but this is so practical here. We can't use this. Do you understand what I'm saying? You don't know, so want to take things wholesale. You want it to be selective. You want it to be critical. You want it to be able to evaluate information. Okay? Teaching, reading, and writing explicitly engages students in monitored and reflective thinking. Now, when I say monitored and reflective thinking, how many of you sometimes read something and you don't realize what you're reading is not making sense? How many of you monitor yourself when you read? How many of you read and don't even realize you're not understanding what you're reading? That happens so often with our students. They read and they just call in words. There's no comprehension. And they become so accustomed to our lazy, boring styles that they're able to, I don't want to say, come their way through. But they know you're going to ask some questions, so they come prepared for you. And they probably get the notes from the year before, from the notebook, and they're able to pass the exercises that you feel good. Not these. Because our students have don't think so. passing grades. <laughs> Y'all understand my point? Okay? So we want students who can monitor their research when they're reading, and we need to shy away from this mentality. It is okay for a student to say, he or she doesn't understand. Because when I put that slide up this morning, y'all didn't understand. The key thing is, when the student does not understand, is for us to supply them with, well, how can you help? How can I help you to help yourself? And there are strategies for that. If you don't understand, these are some, um, some these are some ways, in, you know, these are ways or, I don't want to say solution, but you can do this in order to help you. You're reading something and you don't understand a word, you use the dictionary. What? If you realize that there are some concepts that you know the students are going to embrace and they don't, they're not going to understand them, I like them to develop their own little glossary. And they can formulate a glossary for every chapter. I don't know what the situation is here in terms of use of the computer lab. I don't know what access you are as teachers. I don't know if students are allowed to bring their devices to school. I don't know. But I'm just saying, those are ways around it as well. You find things that they're going to be interested in, things they would want to do. If, let me put some place here, um, if there's a policy against that, I am sure that if you speak to her or whoever the person is in charge beforehand, something can be worked out. You know they don't like to use a dictionary? You know they're gonna have a problem, something you could turn it into a game. Rather than look at your dictionaries and look up that word. They rather Google it, tell them Google it. And then you see why you realize, right? That I'm here speaking and you just think about all the negatives while students are not going to do it. Rather than let me finish, let me finish. Rather than let me try it and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, let me try something else. You want to say something good? Yes. I want to say something good. Now, when you said that I remember being in Sunday school with the boy, Tesla, and the soldier, I could do the dictionary thing with the soldier. Charge. It's soldier. And if you have something, listen, let me tell you, you know you're going to do like, you know, they're going to need certain words for the day. Your crossword puzzle. Put some clues or something. The dictionary game is not going to work for students. They turn off when you hold the pretty small print. One. Sometimes it's difficult. They don't know the skills of um, you know, alphabetizing the information. So find another way. Um, to turn it into a song. When I make up a poem. Um, you know, poetry is not just for the language area. Yes. You know that's interesting. Um, in my class, I did the music. Um, 
and explain why is my story first and why you know the small number. You could write a little paragraph, you could write a monologue, and children, some of them didn't do it. They claimed that they didn't get, I didn't send them the notes. I was like, even if we didn't get the notes, it was based on what you would have learned from the lesson. And some children was going to watch a photograph, a boy started, goes his hand, and I'm like, Rose is that what? This is history. But at the end, he brought out the message and I was like, wow, cool. My niece wrote a monologue. And he was very honest. I was shocked. I didn't even know he had that in her. And the children were like, whoa, we saw his son. And I was like, please, please. She got that from her, but the mother. Sometimes you have to think outside the box to get the children involved. And they were all excited about being taken and stuff like that. I'm, I'm really trying, the children don't like issues. So I'm trying to get them to see that learning is yeah. and learning. I'm coming to you. One of the things you mentioned, Bea, would have been that we need to focus on. We sometimes focus on the product and not the process. And when I say that, because you rightfully said that all, some all did not do it, but you had some. And that some would have been maybe 10 more than you would have had if you went into the same old boring thing. You understand? I remember I'm coming to you. My, my nephew, when he was in grade two, he had a rain gauge to do. And you know when you spend the children go home with these pockets and the parents end up doing them, right? <laughs> It wasn't the best looking one, but when he was finished, he said, Auntie can't take me. And he won because we went on YouTube to see how other children made their rain gauge. And let me tell you, he is, he, he, he is not uh, a really an old boy child, especially at that time. But when he did as I was taking him and he had to talk about his rain gauge, you know, see his little face, how it, how it lit up. And then I told the teacher, I said, why can't have them tape themselves? You know, talking about the rain gauge, but they go make the rain gauge and the rain gauge up in a little corner in the classroom to be swept up or something like that. What would be more meaningful to those students? Not being able to make the rain gauge and being able to talk about it and say how it is used and actually know that they are preparing this for an audience? Yes. I hope you enjoyed part one of our first teacher development seminar 2020-2021 with Miss Williams. You can also listen to part two of this seminar on our YouTube channel. And also, if you like the content on this YouTube channel, remember to like and subscribe and also to tell a friend. Thank you once more for tuning in to SEMS Education.